So today is the 16th um, installment of this series on, on Jewish history. And today we're going to be calling Russia and Europe between the First World War and the Second. And these two events are very important to determine the fate of the Jews. Um, on June 28th, 1914, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire throne, as was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. Um, Austria declare, declares war on Serbia, and it, it gives it brings with it, uh, in addition to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. I'm sorry, um, the Austro-Hungarian um, um, Hungary, Germany, and Turkey, the Ottoman Empire are going to be set against the allies, England, France, um, and eventually the United States. Now, this is a very serious, terrible war. 10 million people died, 20 million were wounded. Uh, one of the reasons that the war was so bestial and, and bloody was that this was development for the first time of long range weaponry so that the killing of people was, uh, and also, even though it was not a face-to-face, a, a -face, uh, um, but nevertheless, uh, it, it allowed for a tremendous and quick form of killing of a lot of people. Um, in this war, um, Jews also fought on both sides of the war, and, and the Allies with French and, and English, and, and on the other side with German and Austrian. Um, they is estimated that one half million Jews participated in the war and 140,000 Jews were killed. This terrible war that initiated all the calamities of the 20th century started on August 1st, 1914. And that was Tisha B'Av, a terrible day that initiated a series of, of actions that eventually ended up with the Holocaust. In fact, the Holocaust would not have been possible and Hitler would not have come to power had it not been for, uh, for the World War First, First World War, the defeat of Germany, and the punishing uh, the Treaty of Versailles that uh, unfortunately created such resentment in a humiliated Germany. Um, let's go back a little bit to this war on the Eastern Front. Um, it's very important to understand what's happening to the Jews there. Germany uh, inflicted serious setbacks on Russia. And the revolution that, that the leftists uh, had initiated in 1905 was aborted. Um, by March 1917, because of the war, because of the defects of the war, the revolution finally succeeds. First, the Tsar is deposed, uh, there is a Bolshevik government, uh, which is socialist, and um, they kept the Russian, Russians in the war. And, um, and then in November, there's a Marxist Bolshevik uh, takeover. Um, it's a Red Army, a war that uh, follows for four years until 1921, a civil war, when the United, uh, the USSR, Soviet republics are created, finally created. Unfortunately, the war, the, the Jews were very much involved in the revolution. It's something very terrible about th this. And, and I mentioned it because the, the fact that so many Jews were involved in the Bolshevik party, and it's estimated that, that in the committees, up to upward of 75% of the Bolsheviks were Jews in the committees. And it, first of all, we have to explain why the Jews were attracted to communism. So one of them is, you know, the, the idea that the, 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 the Marxist model from each um, according to its ability and to each according to his needs was something that appealed to the social justice feeling of Jews. So and the concept of the Tikkun Olam, the idea that we're gonna correct the world, that we're gonna feel, the Jews always had this universal desire to see a society that is more rational, that better, it's unfortunate that, that they followed plans, and maybe they still do, that are not rational, that are not according to, to Jewish tradition or Jewish law. 
but they are very much in line with the Jewish spirit. And therefore they are unfortunately attracted to communism. The social critic, um, literary critic, Edmund Wilson says, Jews and communism are together because it enables the Jew to devote himself to a high cause involving all humanity. And these are the characteristics of a Jew. Lenin, um, when he comes to power, actually tries to rule out anti-Semitism. He obviously realizes there are a lot of Jews in his, in his place. Uh, but as he doesn't attack the physical Jews, he certainly tries to eradicate the Jewish nature of the Jew. So it's to make, not to attack the Jews, but not to make, but also not to allow them to be Jewish. So this deliberate secularization of Jews is a campaign that starts from the beginning. Synagogues are closed, rabbis are persecuted, the, the Hebrew is, is forbidden. There are a lot of terrible things that are beginning to happen in Russia, which uh, as we know, continue for, for decades until finally the, 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 the Russians were able to, um, to um, come back to, um, to outside of, of, of Russia. Um, the reign of, of uh, by the way, the, the, this aspect of deliberate secularization is typical of all authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes try to root out, put down, and minimize the effect of religion because religion stands for liberty, for the freedom of the individual. And it certainly is the greatest enemy of a totalitarian state. So it is typical of all totalitarian regimes to negate religion, to substitute in a sense, their state as a religion. Uh, Lenin dies in 1934, very shortly afterwards. And then we have Joseph Stalin. And Stalin is a murderer. He probably is the greatest mass murderer in history. It is estimated that 25 million people were killed by uh, Joseph Stalin. Terrible anti-Semite, uh, certainly a man who, who, you know, hated Jews and, and partly because maybe, the, you know, the, the, the hatred of Trotsky who was his greatest enemy um, or because, you know, the, the innate visceral anti-Semitism of the man against the Jews. Um, he actually did try to create, to put the Jews in, in a far distant part of the, of the country by creating a Jewish homeland. This was also uh, the idea of moving, removing Jews from all aspects of, of Russian society, so to put them in a ghetto, is to negate the concept of Zionism. Jews, Jews got have a homeland in the Soviet Union in a place called Birovijan and, you know, the there the, the language is going to be, the official language is going to be Yiddish. Many Jews unfortunately did fall for that, uh, but it, it was not a success. Um, Trotsky was the greatest enemy of Stalin, uh, who had, he had been probably the greatest intellectual leader of the revolution even back before 1905, and he was probably the leader of the aborted revolution 1905. Um, he remained a very important figure. But unfortunately, um, the attitude of the, of the Russians towards Trotsky was exactly the opposite of what he thought was going to be. He thought that by becoming communist, people would love him, even though he was a Jew. But he was never anything in their eyes but a Jew. He was a communist in his eyes. He was not a Jewish in his eyes. But in their eyes, in the eyes of the communists, he was Jewish. And uh, Stalin, you know, it's it's a um, is is angry with him. By the way, the one of the important aspects of of Trotsky, Trotsky thinks that the if if you want to save the Jews, you have to overthrow the capitalist system. So the the salvation of the Jews was inextric inescapably linked to the overthrow of the capitalist system. So this is what his dream was. That would, would save the Jews. A little bit similar to a Marxist. Um, philosophy as well. In any case, um, Stalin expels him from Russia in 1929 and remains his mortal enemy until he orders 
people to kill him in Mexico in 1940. During this period of time, in addition to the Jews who were Bolsheviks, um, some small pockets of Jews continue to, ex to practice Judaism secretly in the Hasidim of Lubavitch and other small groups, but they are all very, very small. This is the time when Russia uh, tries to ridicule any Jew who even had circumcision. And so this was a very terrible thing. Uh, shortly before his death um, in 1953, Stalin even orders the killing of um, Jewish doctors. Um, he arrests uh, non-Jewish doctors uh, and uh, they're beaten and, and abused, but um, Stalin dies in the middle. And so nothing happens to them and they are released. It was a salvation because it is revealed later that that was Stalin had intended um, to tell the Russian people that, that these doctors and all Jews wanted to poison and kill all Russians. And so that there would be a tremendous pogrom against them and there would be, Jews would be either killed or forced into this Eurovision dream of Stalin. Um, we will discuss a little bit later in the Second World War that, that um, Russia does save many Jews um, from the Germans. Um, many of the officers in the Russian army are Jewish and they are actually very helpful to, to other Jews. It's interesting how even people without religion, without education, they, they continue to maintain this Jewish identity and compassion for other for their Jewish brethren. Um, I, my just as a general point, uh, personal point, my own um, father-in-law, my, my wife's father um, and his family escaped uh, to a Soviet Republic in Kazakhstan during the war. So the, the, the Russians were actually very, um, in, 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 compared to the Germans, certainly a, a far, far away world. Um, now, we spoke about the Jewish Bolsheviks and the preponderance of Jews in the Bolshevik. So wherever there was a world that opposed the Bolsheviks and opposed Russia, it also viewed the Jews in their country as being representatives of, the, of Russia. This is one of the, dyn the, dyna the dynamics that we're going to see played in Germany. When Hitler attacked the Jews in Germany in the 1920s, he, tell, he sort of presents them as a representative of the Bolsheviks. And no way the Jews can save themselves from that identification. In addition to which, there were many Jews who were actually Bolsheviks, who were very communist in Germany, who were leftists. But by no means they were the majority. But this is the, the plan that Hitler made. Hitler uh, received his, um, in 1932, received 35% of the vote. He creates a party essentially based on the resentment of Germans after the Treaty of Versailles. Um, the Germans were not supposed to arm themselves. They were not supposed to, there were a lot of restrictions on their development. And um, Hitler plays on that. And, um, and the violence, of all the people who participated in the war, which is another aspect, another consequence of the war, uh, makes them makes them very popular. Unfortunately, um, there are two elements in Hitler's rise, which uh, unfortunately sound very familiar to us in in America the 19, in 2020. And it is interesting. First of all, the first thing that we see is that. Um, Hitler uses people in the streets, violent demonstrations, to protest against professors, expel them from their positions, close Jewish businesses, make all kinds of violence in the streets. These people control the street and people are afraid of them. The second aspect of Hitler's rise was the support of the university professors. 
the universities were happy to, to validate this, you know, echt, auch German and, and certainly pride in German, Germany that, that Hitler was talking about and presenting. And these were also, there was a kind of anti-Semitism that had been developing at the end of the 19th century. You know, what we see Nietzsche, Wagner and, and so on, it is kind of, we call, they called it Völkisch anti-Semitism, popular anti-Semitism. And these teachers and professors are in the 20s and now they were educated in this philosophy. So they give a lot of support. One of the most important or the first supporters of Hitler or university students. Sounds familiar. And the third element was the media. The media in, in their visual caricatures of the Jews, in the propagate, propagating of all kinds of nonsensical stories about the Jews, including particularly the protocols of the elders of Zion, this fictitious um, book that was supposed to be that the Jews were controlling the world. All of these, these famous protocols were probably created in, in Russia at the end of the 19th century became very popular in Germany. So you have here this, the, 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 the Jew presented as a Bolshevik, the communist Jew, and Germany, in a sense, against Russia, begins to say, so we are, you're not Jew, the Jews are not patriots. Even though the Jews had participated in, 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 in the war, and they had the cross, the Iron Cross, uh, they, they were professors in university, scientists. We're talking about Albert Einstein, Bruno Walter, conductor, major personalities. Um, until from the beginning of the inception of the Nobel Prize until 1933, Germany won 30% of all Nobel Prizes. And one third of those prizes were all Jews. And in medicine, all of them were Jewish. So Germany, and Germans had Jews who were great patriots. Nevertheless, Hitler was able to convince Germans that, that they had to get rid of the Jews. And in, in the famous book by Daniel Goldhagen of Harvard University, Hitler's Willing Executioners analyzes how the German culture permitted this kind of um, symbiotic philosophy and, and, and identification with the Jews. And that how eventually the, the bureaucrat and, the, and the, the army and the housekeepers and the, the, house, the, the, the people, uh, the housewives and, and, and the regular people were able to immediately see the Jew as the enemy, the Russian, the Bolshevik, the demon. The person who, as, as, and then Hitler started with these racial ideas that if a Jew touches an Aryan woman, he sort of, you know, putrefies her blood and the blood of her children. Horrible, terrible things, nonsensical. But they were able to work on the German mind somehow in the 1930s. It's unbelievable how a madman with mad ideas, unscientific, was able to convince so many people of their of their uh, of his ideas. Finally, so another important point that is important for us to remember is that little, but you know, Hitler wins the election, nineteen thirty three. And he's a, appointed chancellor of Germany by some lack of the democratic process. A very important point. Tyranny does not begin as tyranny. Sometimes a democratic process can actually yield a candidate or a, 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 an administration that eventually becomes tyrannical. And that's what happens with Hitler. He won the election democratically and little by little, he took the democratic system of the Weimar Republic and turn it into a totalitarian state. Started by putting all his prisoners, political prisoners in a place called Dachau um, in Munich. And um, 
he, in 1938, he pressures Austria to unify with Germany, which was one of the violations of the of Versailles Treaty, takes over the Sudetenlands um, against the, without the consent of the Czechs. The English are acquiescent to all of this. Uh, uh, Chamberlain, the famous story, he says, we have peace in our time, peace with honor. Um, and they were, he's emboldened. Um, and many people were, were not opposed to Hitler in America. And then many people were even praising him. There was a famous Walter Lippmann, for example, and others. In America, they, were not, they did not realize his danger. Um, and he's already enacted in 1938, he's already enacted in 1935, the Nuremberg laws, uh, talking about the purity of the German blood, uh, no intermarriage, a Jew cannot intermarry with, with a non-Jew. Um, he cannot be a citizen of the Reich. Jews eventually lose their citizenship, lose their property. Jews do not have the, the concept is that the Jews have done so much harm to the to German society. They defrauded Germany so much that they had no moral right to their property. And eventually they had no moral right to their own lives. Um, and, and Jews are being harassed all through the 30s. The people, as we said, the university students would come and, and they would put signs, Jewish store, don't buy from Jews, burn the Jews, uh, or, or places Jews not wanted, signs and bars and cafes and, and other places, of course, universities are expelling their professors. The famous Edmund Husserl, Husserl uh, the philosopher, uh, British, um, orchestra conductors like Otto von Klemperer, Bruno Walter, who are expelled, and you know other uh, conductors like Edmund von Karajan take, take over. Um, the, of course, Albert Einstein is one of the great uh, physicists that has to to leave as well. All of this in, in sort of call, um, crystallizes, um, ironically enough, in Kristallnacht, November 9, 1938, when 100, 191 synagogues are destroyed on one night, 91 Jews are killed. Uh, people take the Torahs from the synagogue and they put them on the street and they spit, and they run over them, and the Jews' beers are cut. Uh, a tremendous, terrible, terrible event. Um, not well discussed and and um, analyzed even in American media. Um, in October 1938, Germany deports um, Jews who had lived in Germany for many decades, but who came from Poland, and, and, and deports among them 12,000 Jews. Among them, there's elderly couple um, called Greenspan. That had, who had lived in Hanover for over 30 years. And they describe how terrible they were treated in the border, how the, the Germans were spitting on them and, 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 and pushing them around. And uh, they have a son who is in Paris, a 17 year old son. He, and he, when he hears what happened to the, his, his parents, he enters ger the German embassy and kills a German officer. Um, and this unleashes in Germany even a greater violence against uh, against Jews. Um, and finally, we come after all of this period to the Second World War. Now, the Second World War begins on September first, nineteen thirty, with the invasion of Poland. I want to point out something about this war. This famous war that we call, we usually call the Holocaust. Um, the author, historian Lucy Davidovitz calls, her, calls it a war against the Jews. And the reason for that is that the, the, the war had two main themes. One was to erase the Jewish culture of German, in Germany to eliminate what they perceived as the Jewish ideas. Nietzsche had already criticized 
Christianity or and Judaism actually for uh, giving the philosophy of compassion for the weak. In a healthy society, the Germans argued, the weak do not have place. The need, need, weak, need, the weak need to be ostracized, separated, exterminated. Only the strong have a right to live. And the Jews taught the opposite, that we have to be compassionate to the weak. And Christianity borrowed and took over that message. So part of the, the arrogant, violent, uh, Ubermensch, Superman concept of the German philosophy was to eradicate the Jewish concept of compassion and, and kindness and charity and so on that, that we are so proud of. So it was a, it was a, a war against Jewish, Jewishness, against a, a compassionate God, a, 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 against you know, monotheism. And, um, and the second was to get, to get rid of the Jews. Because in addition to the message the Jews are giving, which is the Jews are the carriers of the message. So even when the Jews are not religious, they, they have inside of them, they're able to somehow continue to carry on to this message that was in their blood. And, the re and we see that, 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 the, that Hitler, even up to the last minute, wanted to kill Jews, that a lot of the campaigns that were not necessarily um, milit for, for the advance of military purposes, but nevertheless, they were intended to kill Jews. One of the first things that the Jews had to do is to wear a yellow star. The Magen David it was a yellow uh, background and a black um, Magen David with the name Jude, Jew in it. Um, when the, the first thing that the Germans do when they come into a town in Poland or in, in Lithuania or in, or in Ukraine is they take, they round up the Jews and they kill them. It's called the Einsatzgruppen. These Einsatzgruppen are a very special way. One of the purposes of them was to kill Jews. The famous, and, and the, the, the way they usually did it is they would dig a ravine or a, a, a mass tomb, bring all the Jews to the edge of the, one edge of the of this ravine or, or, or tomb, major pit, and the Germans would be on the other side. And when the Jews were lining up on the line, they would sort of shoot them all. And they were coming into the, into the, into the grave, some, some of them still alive. And then there will be the next group of people coming in. And then again, they would shoot them all and they would put them into the grave. And sometimes they would take little children and throw them into this pit. Babi Yar was a disgusting, terrible act of inhumanity. I want to point out something. Babi Yar um, is a story, uh, you know, that uh, it happened in 1941 near Kiev. 33,782 people were killed. You would ask, how is it possible that they knew so much, 782? Because the Germans in their um, German precision and, and, and scholarship kept copious and thorough records of the, of the killing. It's difficult even to, to speak about this. But because these kind of brutal murders could not be accepted by the, by the Germans, um, they had to make a different plan. And the plan was made, hatched in January 20, 1942 at a major residence called Wanse, and Wanse, Wanse Conference. Um, and there they make plans for the final solution, um, which was going to be run by Adolf Eichmann and Himmler. Um, and this was intended to kill the Jews in a way that would be more acceptable, that would be less brutal. And that's how 
they had the concept of the concentration camps. They created 24 concentration camps. The names we know, Majdanek, Belzec, Treblinka, Auschwitz, Oswiecim, Jews there exterminated by shootings, by injection, by poison gas, then cremated um, their medical experiments on some people. Um, the little story of a little boy who comes to a doctor after the war and says, you know what they did? They, they castrated me. They wanted to see so they were experimenting with me. So he says to the doctor, do you want to see what uh, what they did? He says, no, no, there's nothing I can do for you. They castrated you. He says, no, no, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to see what they did. I want you to remember what they did. It is hard to conceive the scale of heartless atrocities which took place in the 20th century at the hands of the citizens of the most educated country in the world, the most civilized country. Um, in Auschwitz and Birkenau, it is estimated that more than 1,700,000 Jews were, were killed. And in and, and Majdanek, a million and a half. In Germany, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, and Bogenwald, there's a roundup in all other countries to, to concentration camps, not only in Poland, from France and the famous Val d'Iver in July 12, 1942, 28,000 Jews are herded and, and sent to, to um, concentration camps, 120,000 Jews from France. The Jews are, are in, uh, captured in Norway, in Holland, from Belgium, um, Romania, 100,000 Jews are killed. In, in Croatia, the Croatian fascists are cooperating with them. Um, Hungary was okay until when there was an independent state, and then Germany comes in and, and they send the Jews again to concentration camps. Another interesting point in Hungary, by the time they come into Hungary, the war is pretty much, uh, the, the Germans are losing. And instead of spending the efforts on the war, they actually take the time to, put resources to kill more Jews in Hungary. Um, the, the, the Jewish community of Crete, uh, the roads uh, in Greece and Salonika. Italy is a little bit better. Italy, um, although it imitated Nazi policies and there is restrictive legislation, but it is much better than the rest of Europe. Mussolini was, was, was less um, brutal. Uh, until 1943, when the Germans actually come into the country, and then they begin the actual executions. Uh, the only countries that are free from this violence, in addition to the United States, is England and Europe. England, Switzerland, um, European Turkey, Sweden, and Portugal. There was only one land alone where there was popular opposition, and that, that was effective, and that was in Denmark. When, in, when Denmark was occupied, the people refused to enforce discrimination. The king himself threatened to wear the badge of shame if, if the Germans insisted that the Jews wear it. In 1943, Danish patriots managed to save Jews by sending them in little boats across the sea to, to, the, to the safety of sea Sweden. There are some boats uh, uh, of Danish uh, boats on the museum at Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim to remember this event. By no means all non-Jews participated in this. Of course, there were many non-Jews who say, risked their lives to save Jews in all countries, just as there were so many who, who reported them and assisted the murderers. There were many who saved them, protected them. One, uh, many of them were nuns and priests. Um, unfortunately, the Vatican Pius XII was not helpful. And the many stories about him, we do not have time today to analyze. Maybe another time I will give a special lecture between Pius XII and the Holocaust. But Pius XII was very close to Germany. He did not speak about, about Jews. Um, among the in incredible people who helped the Jewish one was, of course, um, the 
consul, Japan, Japanese consul, who in, in Lithuania was able to give the yeshiva mir, or students of yeshiva, a Japanese um, citizenship, and they sent him across the Trans-Siberian Railroad all the way to Shanghai. And, um, and so these are, and there were other people who were a great help. We do not have time to analyze all of them. Um, but uh, one of the famous stories in the, is the story of the war. So the, the, what the Germans tried to do, especially in Poland, was to take the Jews all out of the cities, remove them from um, um, places, and bring them into from the countries and put them into cities, and there to to, to separate them from the rest of society. That was one way, and the society did not feel that they were, you know, uncomfortable that these people were being killed because they were away already in ghettos. Um, and one of the great uh, stories is, of course, the story of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, you know, beautiful story. The, the ghetto had, after it was established, people were not allowed to leave. But um, in the ghetto, there was cultural life continued. Uh, there was even theater. There was yeshiva. There were both students. They were even collecting money for Palestine. Um, and then they started the deportations. And when the start of the deportations, people realized that these people are going to, they already heard of the concentration camp. They heard that people are being killed. And so the, on the night of April 18, 19, 1943, Germans attacked the ghetto because they realized that there's some resistance and the Jews fight to defend themselves. There's a alliance of, of uh, Zionists and secular and religious, and they fight and they fight um, for several weeks. Um, and there's a famous uh, hero, Mordechai Anilevich. There is a town and there's a kibbutz in, in Israel called Yad Mordechai that uh, celebrates this great man's heroism. And um, in his last letter, it dated April 23, 1943, he writes, what happened is beyond our wildest dreams. Twice the Germans fled from our ghetto, so they were defeating it. Um, I have no words to describe to you the condition in which the Jews are living. Only a few chosen ones will hold out. All the rest will perish sooner or later. In the bunkers to which our comrades are hiding, no candle can be lit for lack of air. The main thing is my life's dream has come true. I have lived to see Jewish resistance in the ghetto in all its greatness and glory. But in the end, the Jews were, could not resist. The artillery, the machine guns, and the troops of the Germans. There were about 1,500 German rifles, and there were only 17 guns among all the Jews. It was only a matter of time before the ghetto was destroyed. And this is the story of the ghetto. So in other words, the elimination of Jews was not and it means to an end, it was the end itself. Um, I want to point out a interesting um, description. There was a coordinated um, um, in, 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 in Warsaw Ghetto. Um, more than once, the German troops were driven back. When the central region was at last overwhelmed, resistance continued in the outlying streets. Streets. It was only at the end of May that the last embers of revolt were stamped out. The survivors, some 20,000, were rounded up and sent to the death camps. Warsaw is now Judenrein, free from Jews. The 3,000 years of Jewish history now know of no episode more heroic. Another terrible story that as Jews were trying to escape from Europe, they organized some Romanian people, finally find a, hire a, of a ship was, that's gonna take them to Israel. And in Constantinople, they're trying to do negotiating 
with the the British. Now the British deny that refuse to accept them in, into in, into Israel. This is in 1942, in the middle of the war, the British refused to let these Jews who are escaping from Germany, from German hands, to enter Israel. It happened so many times. Finally, after the terminal negotiation, they could not do anything. They just went into the sea in this rickety boat called the Struma. And the night afterwards, it sunk with all people aboard died, except one survivor. So, so many people died. You know, the Gilbert um, estimated that about six million Jews died. And, um, and we have to ask two questions. Number one, what, why the hatred? Why Jews were hated so much? And, um, you know, there's a interesting comment by um, Dennis Prager and uh, Joseph Tselushkin that I'd like to, to sum up this idea. So they say as follows, from its earliest days, the raison d'etre of Judaism has been to change the world for the better. The attempt to change the world, to challenge the gods, religious or secular, of the societies around them, and to make moral demands upon others has constantly been a source of tension between Jews and non-Jews. Now we understand why so many non-Jews have regarded the mere existence of Jews as terribly threatening. The mere existence of Jews with their different values and allegiances constituted a threat to the prevailing order. I want to end this uh, lecture on this very difficult subject with the two beautiful stories. One is about that in Jews resisted, many. Many could not resist because they were concerned about the consequences of the people around them. And many were quiet and stayed to protect their, the, the elderly. It's a beautiful story um, that I want to share with you um, about a woman called Matilda Bernat. Matilda Bernat um, was a 24-year-old 24 24 Jewish girl in Krakow, Matilda Bandet. She was approached one day by some friends who told her um, that we, we can escape to the forest, to the woods. The girl hesitated and she said, no, my place is with my parents. They need me. They're old. They have no means of defending them themselves. If I leave them, they will be alone. I will stay here with them. So you see here in her decision not to leave the ghetto, not to try to save herself, but to stay with her parents, Matilda Bandit, show the very human dignity, which was exactly what the Germans were trying to destroy. Maybe that's the word. They were not successful. Not only did they not destroy the Jewish people, but they did not destroy all, all, our, and our, our all, our uh, dignity. So as well as six million Jews were murdered, more than 10 million other non-combatants were killed by the Nazis. But the Jewish dignity, the Jewish nation was not destroyed. And I think the final message of this story in the end is that violence in the end is useless because the human spirit is unconquerable. It cannot be vanquished. This is the message of this beautiful story. With the end of the war, a new chapter ends, big opens. The chapter of redemption, the Jewish people, commitment and desire and understanding that the only solution for the Jewish existence is a state in which the Jews can protect themselves. The story of the Warsaw Ghetto was one example 
that in Israel now, we're going to create not a war so ghetto, but we create the state of Israel. And this is the story, which I will tell, God willing, next week.